Red on it, see? Oh. Whoa. Oh. Oh. Look at that. Well, I can see the lake. Oh my god! Okay, here we are at my house and I'm gonna talk a little bit about my Newfoundland moose hunt. I'm gonna kind of actually fill in some gaps because uh, after my wife and I, with our two kids and dog, did our overlanding adventure across Labrador on the Trans-Labrador Highway and we jumped over to the northern peninsula of Newfoundland on the ferry, we drove south to a place called Portland Creek and there's bad weather and we waited for a float plane flight where through Portland Creek Outfitters, we were flowing in a bush plane into the mountainous interior of the Northern Peninsula where we all stayed together in a remote off-grid cabin and Jamie, who's just an epic Newfoundland moose guide, he was um, in SAR tech, search and rescue technician, he served in Afghanistan, he served in Kosovo, lives in three different places in Labrador, almost like nomadically moves between these three off-grid cabins he lives in. So my nickname for him is the Rambo of Labrador. But uh, Jamie and I were the ones that went off and, and did this moose hunt out of this remote cabin in the Northern Peninsula of Newfoundland. And it was a late season hunt, but fortunately because it was a warm fall, the moose rut happened late this year. So we they were still responding and coming to calls, which I wasn't sure if that was even gonna be the case. And the reason I decided to sit down and do this interview is is, you know, full disclosure, I needed to fill in the gaps because uh, there's some challenging aspects to uh, the hunt and some bad things that just happened. I've never filmed a, a moose hunt before. It's very hard to film it as well by yourself when you are, you know, trying to take the shot and film. Uh, you only get that one chance after putting in hours and hours of work and you don't want to blow capturing on a camera or you know you don't want to blow your one chance to harvest the animal which basically I kind of blew my uh, my chance to capture it with the camera because my camcorder smashed on a rock and then I was filming a bunch of it on another GoPro then the memory card for that GoPro also broke so the footage I have of our actual hunting is limited uh, I did of course get some I got a great you know great shots of the moose kind of coming in uh, um, and uh, some other shots, but my camera was malfunctioning, so a lot of it was just unusable. So yeah, I thought it would be a great idea to come and sit down and tell you this story because unfortunately, you know, when you don't have a gigantic budget and you can't just pay someone to fly you in a new camera and, and all that kind of stuff, these things sometimes happen in the field. And I, despite that, I think it's a kind of an interesting format to just kind of sit down and speak to you uh, directly and basically welcome uh, everybody into my home here. So again, I was with my wife and kids. We drove to the island of Newfoundland through Labrador, enjoying an awesome adventure on the Trans-Labrador Highway. You can check out uh, previous episodes that I've posted that will show that whole adventure, which was amazing. We came down the Northern Peninsula of Newfoundland on the Eastern side. There's no road on the Western side. Finally, we made our way to Portland Creek Outfitters where you know we hung out with uh, Leonard Payne and uh, basically just invited us into our home. Uh, awesome, awesome. Uh, uh, business and you know people have heard the hospitality of Newfoundland uh, the kindness of the people there well it's all true so we were just treated like family and then ended up camping in our trailer waiting for the wind to break finally it did so we all got on the plane it was the kids first time on a float plane it was North's first time on a float plane um, and North was you know he heard the noise and he didn't seem to really mind and then all of a sudden he looked up and he looked out the window and looked down and sprung up onto my lap in fear and realized we were way up in the air uh, and then he calmed down afterwards and he was he was cool with it look how beautiful this lake is I know, it's incredible 
Yeah, that's the mountain for flying out into right there. Ready to go on a float plane, bud? All right. We did it! We're ready north. We're ready, Wesley. Jim, we gotta help on a gorgeous flight, so gorgeous much. flight, yeah. yeah. staying in here on this remote lake in Newfoundland. They just finished building this place. Look at this, They're giving you a little tour here. You got a nice little wood stove there. Gun rack here, beds here. Lots of space out here. Beautiful views off to the mountains. Teddy's excited to be inside for once. Look Teddy. at Wesley. Hey Wes, you're doing so good over there, bud. So this cabin's owned by uh, Leonard Payne there, who uh, owns Portland Creek. Um, and uh, I'm gonna be hunting with uh, a fellow by the name of Jamie. Seems like a really good guy, so uh, looking forward to getting out there. So the way this works is um, we basically have our own cabin here, and then there's uh, it connects with uh, the rest of the place. So this is a this is a very big. It's not completely done yet, but this is a big, uh, beautiful uh, place. Um, you know, to have a, a place like this in such a remote area is pretty cool. Jamie was telling me he put in a lot of the work to build it up here for six weeks, milling a lot of the lumber and that. And uh, yeah, it connects over to. Uh, um, another cabin where there's a kitchen as well so we have access to all of it basically so we're pretty excited to be here. Tori how does it feel to, to be indoors? <sighs> Kids seem happy, we're all settled in, and it is time for me to go moose hunting. If anybody knows anything about Newfoundland, they've probably heard that there's a lot of moose here. Um, they're introduced quite a few years ago. Not originally native, but uh, definitely uh, naturalized here. Right now, I'm just basically suiting up. I'm making sure, you know, I got my rain gear with me. I got uh, the clothes I'm gonna need. We should be returning back to the cabin here this evening, but we're gonna head out by Argo and trek and do some calling in a few different spots and you know see if we can't even fill the tag today. Can we get a moose first day? Uh, moose first day. That would be impressive. I don't know if I'll get a moose first day but uh, you know what I'm not gonna not shoot something on the first day that I wouldn't shoot on the last day because I've been in this situation before where I could have taken something on day one and then oh it's gonna be easy the whole time and then you run out of time you get nothing so you don't want to be eating tag soup so anyways yeah. Looking forward to this. Uh, so Jamie and I 
of course, what we did, we went out hunting. We got on the Argo. Argo is a made in Canada. It's an amphibious vehicle and it's got um, basically like tank treads on it. Well, this one does anyways. You can get tires on it, but there's so many bogs there that the tank treads really help you get through this really boggy country. And you know, because this, uh, this area had been hunted already for the entire season, this is an area that was close to the cabin. You know, you get there early in the season, you could probably just go behind the cabin and start calling and get a moose to come in. But because, you know, the moose are a little more wary of people at this time of year, probably a few others of them have been harvested that were in that general area, it's gonna be harder to get something close. But we decided to get out there, give it a shot. So we took the Argo out. But you know what we were doing is we were getting out, using it to you know gain access, getting off the Argo, hike away. Shoot something that came out here freehand? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You think? If something comes up that way, we're laughing, but if he comes over this way, that's what I'm worried about. Right? We just walked quite a ways from the Argo and, uh, we're basically hacking out a spot behind a rock where we're gonna have some cover and the moose are still coming to calls So we're gonna do some calling Jamie here He uh, He's better moose caller than I so He's gonna do some calling see if we can't get a bull to come out, but the issue is I have a nice place to rest my rifle straight If something comes out there or there, it might be a little more challenging to get a shot because I'm gonna have to freehand it. So we'll see how it goes. We get to a spot where we could call. So that's a cow call. And what we'd be doing is we'd set up in a spot, we'd do a cow call, and we'd want to attract a bull basically to come in and mate with that cow. Uh, and so that's, we set up doing that. We called, we called, you know, stayed in one spot for half an hour, 45 minutes. We gave it a good shot in the first spot we tried, which looked really nice. And uh, Jamie kind of hacked a little spot out of the bush for us, got it behind a rock and, uh, did some calls and at one point I saw some trees moving and I started getting real excited but it turned out to be nothing so we're gonna boot it back to the Argo and uh, move on to a different spot. You know we'd be walking 500 meters even a kilometer between different spots going through bogs bushwhacking you name it and then we'd circle all the way back to the Argo you know so all in this day we probably drove the Argo you know probably three kilometers and uh, and you know probably hiked an additional three kilometers or something like that but uh, at one point we wanted to get across this river and we thought you know maybe the, you know people haven't been across the river it looks good over there so you're gonna try to go like this and then all right
That was fun. We just left the Argo behind there on the other side. And uh, first glance, it didn't look like we could cross it, but uh, Jamie found a route and we uh, jumped from rock to rock and made it across. But yeah, hopefully some moose over here. Of course, I have my rifle. Um, I was using a 300 Win Mag, which is a Ruger. And I had uh, Leopold, Boone and Crockett uh, scope on it. So really great uh, gun for moose hunting. A lot of people use a 30-06, but uh, one good thing about the 300 Win Mag, it's good at longer distances. And there's some areas here where the vegetation is very dense and you might get a, an opportunity at a, long, at a longer shot. So anyways, Jamie and I jumped from rock to rock and managed to cross this basically rapid in a, in a rushing stream. We get to another spot that looks great, but it's cold at this point I was dressed a little probably a little warmer than Jamie but we still sat in this one spot found a new little spot here and uh, we're gonna basically we're gonna basically try the same thing again hey Jamie calling yeah so we'll see looks promising though and you know felt the brunt of the wind and sat there jamie was calling i was kind of set up looking you know looking around there's a big huge meadow big clearing timber lines it looked like a great spot but uh, you know sure enough after we were there for 45 minutes we decided to pack it in well we're back at uh, the crossing here No sweat. <laughs> All right, so uh, we came back across this river and uh, tried an area that looked really good. And um, you know, Jamie let out a few calls. I got into a good shooting position, and uh, um, we gave it a good shot. But uh, just from you know Jamie's experience in this area, you let out a couple calls. We're in a remote area like this. If there's anything within earshot of that it's gonna come because they're rutting right now and uh, so after waiting it out a bit it's kind of like no point uh, to wait there anymore because there's nothing right around in this spot so we headed back across the river and we're gonna try another spot likely tomorrow eh? unless we see something on the way back uh, it's gonna be a little harder to get to to say the least but um, anyways back in the Argo and uh, heading back to camp So after the first day, we got our boots on the ground. You know, you start to get a little nervous. You know, we put in we put in a, a, a decent amount of time, and we didn't get anything. We didn't see anything. So it creeps in your mind, man. Is this how it's going to be? So you know, Jamie pointed up to the top of a mountain that's about 1850 in elevation. He said, "Do you see that ball patch up there?" He's like, "That's where the moose are going to be because you know when you get up there, it opens up. There's patches of bush. There's open country. It's at higher elevation, so the." trees don't grow as densely there. Anyways, we made plans the next morning early to head right exactly for that spot. He said, are you up for a, a trek? I said, of course, you know, like the thing when you're hunting moose, you have to pack all the meat down. But for me, it's, you know, I'm packing heavy loads, portaging all the time anyway. So I just look at it like, you know, a portage carrying hundred pounds or more. So sure enough, you know, first thing in the morning we get up, we have a good breakfast and then we headed across the lake in a, it was more or less sort of a fiberglass dory parked it and then uh, made our way up this mountain part of it is 
is quite bushwhacky. You know, more or less, there's a bit of a, a you know a path where you can stay out of the dense vegetation. Uh, however, there were some big bogs that we had to walk around that you can sink quite deeply in, even up to your knee. So we had to bushwhack. We couldn't go straight through the bog, or we would have got soakers. Rubber boots are a must. I was wearing good muck boots. Basically, uh, heading up a mountain here and uh, stopping every little ways and throwing out a few calls, sort of coming in slow and fairly quietly. But uh, I'm hoping there might be something up on the bald patch of this mountain here. So, putting in a few miles today. I'd rather make up there for a good view than make a mistake. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah, we don't have much of like something's gonna have to come out right there or here, right? Oh, yeah. Good feel the view up here. Okay. Picked a high point of land up on some top of some rocks. There was some cover, and I could see probably about a kilometer in one direction. You know, probably about 800 meters in another. You know, patches of open country like meadows, bog, and and patches of denser bush, and it looked like a perfect perfect spot and so Jamie said you know what we're gonna stay here uh, for a long time Jamie's just giving me a few tips on how to just get that call out you really want to think about it like you're gonna make it echo and really let it come from your stomach when you can't see anything because you want something far away to hear it and then you got to get quieter as they come in closer but we're just trying to um, mimic the sound of a cow moose calling. And because we're in the rut, it'll draw the bulls in. Um, the rut is a moose mating season. So we're basically trying to call bulls in by pretending we're a cow. I'm not a cow, though, but I've been called worse. <coughs> I wonder if you could see kind of like some open patches, eh, from yeah, over there? Know, maybe. Yeah. I'm calling, Jamie's calling, we're doing cow calls. We actually didn't bring a call. I brought my birch bark moose call with me and, uh, you know, was practicing and all this kind of stuff. My son Hudson was practicing in it, so I ended up you know, br bringing my moose call up there and not even, not even using it, um, but it, you know, Turned out probably didn't need it if you have a really loud voice, which uh, Jamie definitely did, and mine was loud enough. <coughs> you know, sure enough, I spotted uh, a moose, and likely if it's coming to your call, it's gonna be a bull, because it's coming to a cow call. And I spotted a moose coming out of a, a dense timber line, probably about a kilometer away. So good, good distance away. We both had binoculars and we couldn't tell of the size of it or not. Now, I wasn't really going out there with a specific you know, size or, or whatnot of moose that I wanted, right? I didn't want to be eating tag soup. <laughs> I didn't want to come home with nothing. You know, I guess what I'm trying to say is I was just planning on shooting more or less the first thing I saw as long as it was a bull. So the first bull I saw, I was going to be happy with. So I'm calling, Jamie's calling, and we see this uh, bull come up. And I point it directed to where Jamie is. He gets his binos on. I get my binos on. We see it. We keep calling it. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It gets close enough that Jamie can see that, you know, it's not a very big bull. It's a small, young bull. I said, you know, I'm happy with that. Let's let's keep trying to attract this bull to come in. So then, uh, you know, it kind of stopped. And it, it was sort of looking back. And it didn't want to come. And we were thinking, oh, geez, it's not coming. <coughs> Sure enough, we call again and it starts coming towards us. And at this point, it's probably over 400 meters away. And Jamie knew just by the way it was acting that it was coming towards our calls and that, you know, it's on basically. So the bull came along and it entered a patch of dense bush where it couldn't see us from that distance. We couldn't see it anymore. So we picked up and we moved quickly 
to a better location knowing that when it came out of that patch of dense bush that we would be in a better position to make a shot on this thing. We got up, grabbed our stuff and run, you know, stealth like a good little distance into another sort of vantage point. We hadn't even called yet. I was looking at this other bull here. Well, at that same time, Jamie goes, big bull right in the bush over here. And I look over and sure enough, this big bull was within a hundred meters of us. And thinking back, that's probably the scent of that big bull. It's probably what was scaring this younger bull from coming in any further. So we didn't even see this. But the thing is, we were looking at where this small bull came into the bush. And, you know, we were saying, well, if it comes out there, of the bush there, we'd be okay. If it comes out there, we'd be okay anywhere except right in this area. And well, sure enough, right in that area is where that big bull was. So it was in, you know, the worst spot for me to get, you know, a, a good and ethical shot on this thing. We're not calling at this point, we're watching it. I'm telling you, when you are, feel that kind of adrenaline rush of the, the, of the hunt, even if you're a good shot and you've practiced, you know, it, you're that gonna be that much shakier when you're actually shooting. So that you need to practice more to, to make up for the fact that your heart's gonna be beating and you're gonna be maybe tired and you're gonna be shaking a little because of the adrenaline from the hunt itself. So anyways, I, I put my rifle up and I got the scope on and the moose was moving and it just was not a, a, a ethical shot. Like I'd see moose, trees, 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 moose, moose, trees, moose, trees. And at this point it looked like the moose was gonna leave and I just did not feel uh, safe taking the shot and I was thinking well you know cool experience maybe we'll get one later today or tomorrow you know I was thinking maybe maybe this was it but I, I really you know I really didn't want to uh, pass up this opportunity you know Jamie saying you shouldn't call when it's this close um, you know because it'll kind of know, it'll hear the call, it won't smell the moose, and it'll spook it. Well, I decided to call anyways, and sure enough, it spooked the moose, but fortunately, it actually 180'd, and it ran out of the bush, and ran up onto uh, a perfect vantage point, looking like the front cover of, the mag of a magazine. However, it was moving quickly, and that's when Jamie let out a bull call. A call that means, hey, you wanna fight? So Jamie, you know, knowing this is the perfect time to let out a bull call to stop this moose from running. He lets out the bull call, the moose stops, it turns to us, looks like this, and there was my shot. I took as much time as I possibly could. I felt really good about my shot, and boom, I let it fire, and uh, the moose dropped right away. It just went right down. Sure enough, we got our moose, and what an experience that was. This was uh, day two of our hunt. Got this little, uh cold steel Securex. Yeah. This little guy here. Oh yeah. And you can swap out the blades too, but nice. they don't you don't have to throw them out. You can resharpen them. That's good, yeah. Yeah. We did not field dress it in a typical way. Like we didn't gut the moose. What we did is we took all the neck meat, we took the front and back quarters off of it, and we took the back straps off and then uh, the fillets we took out uh, by breaking the top of the ribs and rip uh, and taking them out from underneath, which Jamie was amazing at. I've never done uh, it this way. To the way I've done bison, uh, deer is, you know, you gut them. So we pulled these quarters off and uh, we decided to um, take it in two trips. So we brought game bags with us, uh, and after a long time, after I basically you know, skinned the head and all this kind of stuff and prepared everything, almost completely deboned everything, which was a big job as well. But where, you know, you take all the bones out because you're trying to reduce the weight you're gonna have to carry. You don't need to haul these bones out. couple of trees so we can rotate it over and uh, get the back straps and tender lines okay and whatever organs you want yeah we'll have a look at liver yeah there's no spots on it I'd say it's good yeah but spots where it looks really grayish let's leave it for the ravens yep. 
I would. Yeah. We ended up hanging uh, the four quarters up in very small trees and just hoping no bears. There's a lot of bears there, but we we're hoping no bears would uh, would get to them. And you know, you get them off the ground and you get them up as high as possible. You do the best you possibly can for them. But at this time, we knew we wouldn't be able to come back to the for those to the following day. Now we had to climb down the mountain with the moose and of course Jamie and I were up for you know carrying heavy heavy loads however there's no way we could get this whole thing down in one load took out the rack which was a 41 inch spread that's the skull and the rack so this is a very heavy thing and just you know clumsy gets in the way when you're bushwhacking because you're carrying it on your back like that jamie's pack was probably over 100 but i think his might have been heavy than mine and then mine was of course super heavy and then i have the freaking skull and rack on my back and you know we start to go and it's we're sweating we're sweating a lot we're going down this mountain uh, we get to that one big bog that we're having to go around and you know your feet get stuck in the bog you start to fall over with all that uh, weight on your back and you can get hurt. I actually lost my boot in the mud at one point on this mission Well, I had a heavy pack on and I managed to basically regain and pull it out and get it back on without Getting my sock completely in the mud. Get out of there you bastard uh, So that was a very big challenge uh, very hard to walk through that thick bog with all this weight on your back but we kept going and we kept going you know taking breaks when we had to you know taking breaks where we could kind of sit down on a ledge and get that weight off of our shoulders a bit and uh, we didn't rush but you know we weren't taking our sweet time either and we managed to get all this back to the lake well i can see the lake oh yeah we did it uh, 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 yeah. Hey, looks good. Yes, buddy. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. It's like good, a good scotch. There you go. Get it in ya. We made it. We got the uh, meat dropped off here back at the lake. It was uh, tough going in a few places, but we had gravity with us because we we're headed downhill for the most part. Where we pulled the boat up, we bushwhacked up to uh, there. So we just basically walked these uh, the meat packs down to the lake and now we're bushwhacking back to the boat we're gonna pick them up with a boat and shave off probably 100 meters or more of bushwhacking so pretty good plan no we're not doing that no yeah we're going where i said yeah you said well let's follow this this uh quad trail or something yeah. or whatever it was uh, you yeah your brain trying to take yeah. the easiest route yeah and then you just you're just like nope first Stick with the plan, basically. Yeah. yeah. There's our stuff right there. Yeah, you know, if it's cooler fucking packing that rack out, like, let's be honest, you know, isn't it? Than that little tiny bowl, you know? You get more meat, too. It might be tougher, but you get more. <sighs> I forgot how heavy it was already. <sighs> That's a lot of meat. Whose is heavier? Mine. I think yours is too. <laughs> Just loaded all this uh, meat and the rack and everything into the boat. And at this point I was feeling good. You got a successful hunt, but you also, you know, don't feel great for killing something, uh, but you also feel excited about the meat that you're gonna get. This healthy meat to feed your family. And once you start deep boating it and you see those back straps come off, it just starts to look delicious, basically. We start making our way back across the lake, and uh, sure enough, Tori comes out of the cabin and sees us 
Well, she said that she could tell that we seemed to be going slower and our boat was a little bit deeper in the water. So she ran and got the camera thinking that maybe we got one. I grabbed the rack and the skull and I stood up in the boat and held it up like this to show her we got one. And she's just like, oh my God, they got one. Oh my God. We got about 300 pounds of meat to eat now, honey. I was wondering why they were driving so slow. And I thought maybe because they have a fully loaded boat. And I was right. Good boy. Good boy. And uh, it was very exciting. So she came in and congratulated us. And uh, we eventually brought the kids down, you know, to the dock and uh, showed them the, the, the moose rack and the antlers. Yeah, North, you got a moose, bud? You got a moose? You like eating moose? You're going to get some of that. Yeah. Good boy. North is excited. <laughs> That's it, we, uh, we still gotta go back and do another trip tomorrow, but uh, we got the moose out, the majority of it out, and the rack out, and uh, yeah, we got more work to do for sure. We gotta hang it up and wash it off and get it ready to uh, get out of here and uh, probably gonna be taking it to the butcher as well, but uh, bulk of the work is done, but still more to do. Anyways, awesome day. Uh, it is a beautiful day, beautiful morning. And we didn't have to get up, you know, well before first light today because uh, today isn't going to be as intense. We still have to climb up to the top of that mountain where I harvested the moose and load the remaining uh, quarters into backpacks and come down. So, you know, have to do basically what we did yesterday again, but uh, our loads are going to be lighter today. So, um, yeah, shouldn't be as challenging. Yesterday, um, I dropped my camcorder that I'm talking to now, smashed on some rocks in the water, and unfortunately wasn't working. So I didn't really get to get the beautiful shots of the scenery um, or of the moose coming in when I call them as well as I'd like to be, but um, uh, yeah, which is too bad. So, but I still managed to capture a lot of it um, just with my GoPros and stuff like that. But stuff happens like that when you're out in the bush. I don't have a dedicated uh, shooter here like you'll see on a lot of these outdoor shows. So um, the fact that we were still able to adapt and, um, you know, still film the thing and still have a successful hunt, um, I'm happy with. Anyways, yeah, beautiful day. I'm just gonna go uh, grab Jamie. We're gonna head off on the boat and uh, make our way up the mountain. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look like uh, it's that dangerous, but I just stepped right there and sunk past my knee. Almost fell completely into this bog. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you know. Well, now we know not to step there, but yeah, I was not expecting that. So I almost just basically went for a swim there. made 
get back on top of the mountain and uh, looking for the quarters we uh, hung in the tree yesterday. Should be just over the next hill here. Hey? Yeah, we'll do bone them back to the camp. What's that? We'll do bone them back. Though. Okay. Keep them way cleaner. Yeah. And I don't find it heavy, so yeah. and it's way back. easier to to uh, lug. Yeah. You mean like that? Yeah. And keep it way cleaner. We'll see how it feels in you know a couple hundred meters. Oh, we'll still take a couple breaks. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, we got these quarters in the back here. See right there. I wouldn't call it light, hey Jamie? Yeah, it's a good turn. But it's, uh, yesterday was, you know, Jamie probably had 100 pounds. I didn't have much less, plus I had the rack, so, you know, between the two of us, we probably packed out a couple hundred pounds of meat, so this seems easy compared to that. Better to get the hard trip done first, though, eh? Perfect. Yeah. There's Jamie there taking a break, slacking off again. Just kidding, buddy. Hey, but is, uh, see what he does, the best way to rest is uh, you find like a little bench, a natural little hill or a rock, and you can sit right down, rest the pack on it. It takes uh, all the weight off your shoulders and then you don't have to pick your pack up again, which is takes a lot more energy. So good method. Same route as yesterday, uh, but we pulled the boat up in uh, an easier spot today. The same spot where we loaded in the uh, quarters yesterday. So should be out of here a little faster. Definitely lighter low, but uh, beautiful, beautiful. Coming down off this mountain. Perfect. I think that was a good stroll for a morning hike. Absolutely. And look at the lake is still perfectly calm. Here comes Jim showing his butte strength. <laughs> ah, there we go. Beautiful day today. Jamie and I got the rest of the meat down off of the mountain and uh, came back for a nice lunch. Um, meals are provided here at Portland Creek, um, which has been great because it gives you more time to hunt, more time to handle the meat and just frees up your day. And with Tori also having to solo uh, parent while I'm off in the bush, um, it's making life a lot easier. So. Uh, that's been awesome. Jamie and I are just uh, cleaning off the meat, you know, just uh, little hairs, little um, uh, moose hairs and little leaves and stuff that might get onto the quarters as we're hauling them around in the bush. So we're just kind of cleaning that out of them. So right now I'm just gonna um, help Jamie haul this boat out. They don't need it in the water anymore. So I offered to give him a hand and uh, we're gonna pull the motor off and uh, lean it up for the season with the other boat you see there. shut down for the season we were going to be the last people there so I helped them get the boat out of the water which was you know not the easiest it was pretty heavy and just did some some basic uh, kind of typical cabin close-up stuff want to help me carry some wood okay. no okay. how am I going to carry you in the wood at the same time
had an amazing meal of fried, fresh cod. <laughs> Got a little deep fryer going here, making some uh, some French fries. Cuddy, you gonna eat all that? Hey, bud. We had cod before, but this was fresh cod with a little bit of, of lard in the oil, a little bit of salt, and also put in, uh, I don't know if it wasn't lard, but it was like some sort of pig lard that they put in the oil for flavor, then salt and um, a little bit of flour and, and fried. Oh my God, it was so good. Way fresher, way better than any cod you're going to get um, when you're not, you know, on the East Coast, that's for sure. Next, I got some pretty big totes. You want those first, or? Yeah. All right. We're in. We're on the plane. Okay. Bird family on the plane. So that's it, we just got off our plane, um, had a great time just deep in the backcountry of the Northern Peninsula, got a moose and uh, flew out. So we're just getting picked up here by Portland Creek Outfitters and um, short little drive back to our truck and our trailer and then uh, we head south to Grossmore National Park for the next leg of our adventure. And here we are, back at the truck. <laughs> And before too long, we all loaded back in the float plane and we flew back to where our vehicle was waiting for us near Portland Creek. So incredible experience by Portland Creek Outfitters. Um, just wanted to say thank you to you know everybody there for making us feel so uh, welcome and just being really cool, good people and uh, giving us that great experience as well. I uh, consider Jamie to be uh, you know a friend now, um, and you know it's just the way these people are. They make you feel like family. If you want to get a moose, 
you know, I can't imagine uh, a better outfit to go with uh, than Portland Creek. I mean, look at my story. I think that the key is their, their guides and the positioning of their camps um, is, is key. So, you know, just being in Newfoundland helps a heck of a lot as well. So basically the way it works is you get your meat back and you take it to a local butcher. Now, Tori and I, um, didn't have time to quickly drive back with all this meat and do the butchering there ourselves. You can do that, you can drive back, let's say if you have a, bring a freezer and a generator and a trailer with you or the weather's cold enough that you can hang the, the meat in the trailer and just drive straight home. But because we had the kids, because we were headed to Grossmore National Park to spend multiple days backpacking, we knew that wasn't an option so we took it to the meat shop amazing people the owner was a, f a fan of alone so i had a great chat with him because he'd watch me on alone they cut you know how many rows how many steaks how much ground you want you let them know exactly like this i decided to keep a scapula because on the uh, the front quarter i didn't completely debone it so i brought a scapula and a scapula can be used um, when the moose are in heavy rut to scrape branches and tree bark and stuff like that to sound like a bull raking its an antlers and it can be used to draw another bull out to fight so it's a great moose hunting uh, utensil what they do is they butcher it all up they freeze it and then and they put it on a freezer truck and then they'll drive the meat back so they drive some to the state so americans will go to a pickup location in like pennsylvania for example and pick up their meat the only uh pickup location they have in ontario is down near niagara so they're driving to a refrigeration facility in Niagara on their way to the States to give meat to Americans. And then what I do is I drive down to Niagara, which is about four hours from my house, pick up the meat and we're good to go. You get everything butchered up, you get uh, the whole moose I have, uh, essentially an entire moose. So that should be lasting us probably a year, up to a year and a half. We usually go through them pretty quick though. So all in all, incredible uh, moose hunt, incredible experience. Just the float plane, being able to do it as a family. Just want to give a huge thanks, of course, to Tori, who uh, helped the kids as I got to go off hunting. I'm sure it was a little challenging for her with both kids uh, in the days by herself when I wasn't around. So that's why I want to thank her uh, for that sacrifice. Thanks to Portland Creek Outfitters and uh, to Jamie. I hope uh, we get to do another hunt in the future as well, Jamie. And also just a real hunt. You know, we climbed a mountain. We harvested this moose on top of a mountain. We packed the whole thing down. Like that is, you know, what you call fair chase. You know, that is a, that's a real hunt. We had to work for it. Uh, and we weren't afraid to do the extra work to get to a good spot. And it's like with anything, you know, you want to get to good fishing, usually you have to work a little bit harder to get to those spots uh, where the fishing is good. And this is uh, was an example like this, so it made me just feel better, feel like the whole thing was more an adventure and amazing experience all in. We had some gorgeous sunsets, some gorgeous uh, sunrises as well. Um, and just an incredibly beautiful area. So all in, amazing hunt, amazing experience. Uh, for me, you know, there, there's uh, things that don't always make me feel great in the moment. The actual act of killing is not something that I could definitely would say I enjoy, but overall the, the hunt, the pursuit, the feeling of watching your family eat, the, the, the feeling of giving meat to people who, you know, maybe couldn't afford uh, meat, especially um, in the store in, in that capacity and, and watching them enjoy it. It's, uh, it's deeply satisfying uh, to me and the whole experience really strikes a primal chord in me, puts me in touch with my ancestors, puts me in touch with, uh, you know, indigenous people. Um, makes me understand their customs and culture uh, better and uh, in general just how we're all in this together when it comes to conservation whether you don't hunt at all and you're a backpacker or whether you're you're a hunter and and you know don't backpack and don't do that kind of uh, sport at all you know um, we all have our, our place in conservation um, uh, protecting wildlife and, and my uh, most important thing to me when it comes to conservation is habitat protection basically keeping you know development out of wilderness areas is what I find is most important to me and, and hunters play a huge role in that and care about 
the uh, these animals and the life cycles of these animals and understand them in a deeper way than almost anybody does and that's not all hunters but a lot of hunters really have a connection and so it feels good to have a, a part in that and uh, it feels amazing to have had that experience with Portland Creek Outfitters in beautiful Newfoundland but that wasn't it we continued on down the coast um, till we reach Grossmore National Park, which is just an absolutely epically beautiful park. A highway goes kind of through the eastern portion of it and you can access trailheads and do multi-day or many incredible day hikes. So in the days to come, me, Tori, and the two kids on an extremely windy day, summited Grossmore Mountain, did an 18K return hike in a day with an enormous elevation gain and a, gain and a huge rock scree scrambled as well. It's an amazing adventure. And I am going to go upstairs and have myself a moose burger. We just saw a big old bull moose on the trail. And uh, you know, this is the moose that rots late this year. So the moose are in the rut. They can be a dangerous thing to encounter.